Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's the first time in the new building. Fantastic digs you got over here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, the project, this project. It's on a domain-specific language called P. And the word P is for protocols. So when we build uh, asynchronous event-driven programs, then protocols usually end up being part of the programming. Uh, because of all these components that are interacting asynchronously with each other. This kind of programming is very important uh, these days uh, because uh, in, the world, in the world of devices and services. So when you have devices and services talking to each other, can everybody hear me at the back also? Um, usually you can't do uh, synchronous invocation. So what is the classic example of synchronous invocation is uh, a procedure call in an imperative language like C. So where the caller uh, waits until the call returns and then the results are available to it. So uh, if, uh, for example, a device is uh, talking to a service across the wire, uh, usually it can't afford to wait for it. So uh, for performance reasons, you have to do overlapped execution. So the standard model of uh, communication is via events. So uh, these components send events to each other and the responses come back via events also. So. Um, um, it is well known that uh, this kind of programming is much harder than ordinary sequential programming. So when you have overlapped computation, overlapped concurrent asynchronous computation, uh, you get bugs because of uh, timing. And these bugs are very, very hard to reproduce and fix. The standard debugging experience that uh, we have come to expect when we are debugging a sequential application in, say, Visual Studio, where you can set breakpoints and you can have a full repro uh, if you have established the input that causes a failure. That kind of uh, debugging experience you just don't get anymore because we don't really have control in the live execution over all the sources of uh, non-determinism and uh, concurrency that can happen. So as a result, all these, the kind of bugs that happen, they are very, very difficult to, to fix. So these problems are not really new problems. We have been aware of these problems for decades. And even inside MSR, uh, back when Sriram was, in, uh, was working in Redmond many years ago, we started a project called Zing. So the goal of the Zing project is basically I have lifted it verbatim from the web page of the, of, the, of the Zing project. This is what we were trying to do 10 years ago. Um, and if you read it, it looks like a very modern project also. These are all problems that exist today. And we built this kind of uh, infrastructure for exploring the states of these asynchronous uh, models. So the idea was that um, there's all these uh, protocols sitting in applications. So we will provide people with a Zing modeling language where they write down the, uh, the model in the, in the modeling language. And we will explore all the executions. And we will give them bugs. They fix those bugs. Ultimately, uh, the model becomes correct. And then they'll go and implement it uh, in code. So we, we, we built all this. And we were expecting you know, lots of accolades and uh, bonus and promotions and those kinds of things. But nothing like that happened. Um, we didn't get a single user. Um, and we, I mean, I guess you know this was it was not news to it was news to me at that time, but I guess this is like also another age-old problem. This is the problem, the modeling conundrum. So when you when you go and ask a programmer, hey, why don't you use Zing? He'll say, what? What do I have to do? I have to go write a model in Zing. Why would I do that? I'm gonna go ship code. That's what I'm paid to do. Why would I go and write this model in your Zing modeling language? Um, why don't you just use my code instead? That's a model. Yeah, that should work. And one, one actually, you know, these things are kind of bogus. But this is the real uh, argument, I think. This is the main reason why programmers hate to 
do a separate modeling exercise that is not connected to, to code, which is that these models get out of sync with code. It almost never happens that all the design decisions get taken inside the model. Usually these things get refined later and uh, requirements change and so on and so forth. So the model gets out of sync. And at some point this, this model is basically obsolete and loses all connection with code. So in the P project, we are trying to uh, remove this fundamental uh, blockage to adoption of uh, uh, high level modeling and uh, testing um, that we believe can dramatically improve programmer productivity. And we are going to accomplish that by blurring the distinction between modeling and programming. And the way we do that is that we provide people uh, a domain specific language and we give them both modeling and testing at the level of that language and also code generation so that what gets executed in the in a live execution right is exactly what they're modeling so this problem of two different representations of your behavior that that just vanishes um, so we have had more success with this story now uh, so in fact there are two shipping products uh, that that have been developed using using P the USB device driver that runs on this Windows 8 machine and that has been recently unified after we became one Microsoft um, we decided to unify the the USB device driver stack across phone and uh, desktop and uh, both of them are implemented in P Okay, so uh, first I want to give some credit. So this project is actually um, um, is about three years old and it has been done in collaboration with many people both here in, um, uh, in Bangalore. So Sriram has been involved in the project and uh, in, in Redmond, Ethan Jackson, uh, my colleague in RISE is involved in it. And then there's uh, people in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in product groups. So these two engineers, this is Randy All and Vivek Gupta. They were the early adopters, and in fact, they co-designed the very first version of P. Um, and also, you might, some of you might remember Ankush Desai. He was uh, a researcher here, a young researcher here, and since then, he's, he has moved to Berkeley to do a PhD. So these guys are proudly standing in front of their state diagrams. So the relevance of these state diagrams, I will explain later. What does P have to do with the state diagrams? So some stats from from the old effort of the developing the USB device driver stack in Windows 8. Um, I don't have any stats for the Windows phone. I stopped keeping track of all that once the value became abundantly clear. So what you're seeing here is uh, some idea of the uh, size of the design that was implemented in, in P. So P, as I'll explain later, it is a, it's a language in which you can have macro states and transitions together with code uh, annotating states and transitions and so on. So some idea of uh, the size of the design can be obtained by looking at the number of states and number of transitions. Um, you can think of this as the semicolon count of uh, traditional uh, programming language, like how much sequencing there is. But unlike traditional languages, you know, like, so if you have like 500 lines of code or 2,000 lines of code, that might, you might think of as a small program. But remember that this is a DSL for only protocols. And uh, if you have 2,000 lines of protocol, that's a very big design. Because there's a lot of, you can pack a lot of complexity into, into a very short description. Okay, so these are all significant designs. The, the hub driver was built out of uh, interacting state machines, four different kinds. So these are the four rows. And on this side, it tells you uh, the the bugs that were discovered. So a total of more than 300 bugs were discovered during the during the exercise. Uh, but you can't really. I mean, the thing is that they were keeping the programmers were keeping track of this because this was something like a skunk works project. Ultimately, they they knew they had to justify this to their to their managers. That's why they were keeping track of it. But for example, this the experience that you get is that is the same kind of experience when you build a program. In, uh, in Visual Studio, right? A little bit like that. You don't keep, I mean, you're finding bugs and fixing them all the time. That's the beauty, right? When, you, when, you, when this thing is rolled into programming, 
uh, it doesn't look like, hey, one bug, you know, I spent like an entire day trying to uh, fix a bug. These bugs were found and fixed pretty rapidly. Okay. Um, so another interesting thing is that these bugs were found before uh, they had code running on the on the machine, which is also very nice. Yes. No, they would. They are. They are pretty much related to interaction between various state machines. Yes. And each of these bugs would actually potentially lead to a failure. It's not just a missing the or. So the thing is that is this is the thing you can't tell, right? Because this is we are programming right now, right? Nothing is running. So. Um, or what's the definition of bug? Yeah. So the bug would either be. So what? What is? What the way? The way it works is that you write down the protocol definition and then you write a whole bunch of specifications on it and then there's a whole bunch of implicit specifications that you get just from programming in p like the the uh, the analog would be you know like if you're programming in c sharp you get null dereference exceptions or a class cast exception so there's a bunch of default specifications like that and then there's a whole bunch of specifications that you write on top so each one of these bugs is a violation of some such specification now, it could mean that there's a bug in the code, but it could also mean that your understanding was wrong and you wrote the wrong specification. That's also counted as a bug. So, so how, how tightly is it coupled with programming? I mean, does, does it run like you run when you compile? Or? No, not yet. So, so the issue is that, as I'll explain later, there's a bunch of static analysis that happens, but that's kind of simple-minded. All the fancy concurrency-related stuff we only do testing right now. It's very expensive because of the combinatorial nature of um, the behaviors. We are doing systematic enumeration of uh, the behaviors. And we, we, we put in a lot of effort into prioritizing the enumeration in such a way that you don't have to wait too long to find bugs. right? And there's many things you can do. We have invent, invent, investigated lots of heuristics for doing prioritized search. But ultimately, you don't get the kind of instantaneous uh, compile edit kind of thing that you, that you got. I mean, you can fix a little bit of that by having different modes. I mean, basically, we can test as much as you want. So we can have, we can impose bounds, right? Um, you know, we test only for, say, 30 seconds before we stop. And you, you can start, I mean, and then you, you do longer runs when, you, when you're doing overnight and things like that. Uh, but we haven't engineered it to that extent yet. Uh -huh. So, uh, out of curiosity, how many instances of those bugs were where the spec was wrong? Uh, uh, well, did anybody even care? I guess. Yeah, at that point, people don't care so much. My feeling is that if you are doing it like this, you uh, 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 the, getting the spec wrong, you would take it as seriously as getting the code wrong. Right. Because what, what happens is that you, you, when you're coding, you're right, you are doing that coding, uh, there, there's an expectation of what the environment is supposed to do, what the code is supposed to do, and if you get that expectation wrong, that you consider that very seriously also. Yeah, because uh, we, when we were, anyway, I don't want to derail, but I guess you don't have a big complete number, right? No, I mean, we'll have to go and look back at all those, those things, yeah. Okay, all right, so, uh, so getting into the programming model a little bit, so, this is very classical, communicating uh, state machines. State machines interpreted very loosely. Uh, these are not finite state machines. Um, and these queues are not necessarily finite. So this is essentially a Turing com complete model. Uh, but at a high level, it looks like state machines that are sending events to each other. And all the state machines are running concurrently. Uh, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> there's details, of course. You know, that was just the computation model. From there to a programming language, you have to decide a whole bunch of things, you know, like concrete syntax, uh, semantics, how do you write specifications, how do you test and verify programs, how do you compile these programs for efficient execution, and so on. So I'll try to touch upon all of those things now. So at a top level, uh, a P program is a collection of event declarations. These are going to be the primitives that will be used for communicating among machines. So each event declaration has a type associated with it. 
So when you when an event E uh, is sent from one machine to another, uh, a payload can accompany it. So if the event E has a type T associated with it, then you can attach a payload of type T to it. Okay. Um, then there's a collection of machine types. So these are templates. And uh, to create an instance of a machine, you do the equivalent of new in, in C sharp. And a fresh machine with its own state and its own input queue uh, comes up and starts execution. Inside a machine, um, at a macro level, you have these states and these transitions. Uh, but inside each state, there is a lot of control flow happening. And uh, basically, we have variables. And uh, um, you can write computation inside the state that manipulates uh, those variables. And it can, you can also send events. Um, and uh, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you have a stack, so you can do the equivalent of uh, uh, push, uh, pushing uh, something on a stack, uh, like a function call. So we have a lot of uh, mechanisms for trying to write down these, what, what essentially amount to large go-to programs in a, in a compact way. So each, each machine is single threaded? Yes, that's the semantics. And each the event processing of an event is, is, uh, is I mean, it's, it's one event at a time? One event at a time, that's right. So the, the execution model is that one event is dequeued according to some dequeue logic from the input queue. And uh, then the handler for it executes. Uh, that handler is going to uh, potentially update the local variables, uh, send uh, other events out, and then eventually go and again try to dequeue something from, from a machine, uh, from, from the input queue. And, and does each machine have one queue, or can you have multiple queues? And each machine has one queue. So uh, the, there is, like in Pi calculus, you have explicit channels, right? So here we don't have that. The channel ID, the input uh, channel of a machine, it has the same ID as the machine ID. So you send an event to that machine, and it just gets enqueued in there. So it's more like the actor model. Right, right. So if you wanted to do things like uh, prioritize events or something, yes. you have to do that in your code. So uh, we don't have a notion of priority. In a very, very early version, like minus, version minus one of P, uh, uh, Vivek and Randy had introduced some notion of priority. But things were, from a semantic standpoint, they were getting so complicated that at some point it was dropped. And we have something simpler, uh, more general, in fact, uh, which suffices for, for, the, for, for these designs. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Oh, OK, so actually, I, I, can, I can go over that right now. So we have the notion of uh, deferred events in a state. So um, supposing you wanted to give higher priority, higher priority to event A as opposed to event B, meaning that if A and B are both in the queue, you would rather handle A than B. Then you defer B inside that state. You can, you can write that annotation there. So the logic, the DQ logic, is that um, uh, start looking from the front of the queue for the first non-deferred event, and then you DQ it. And if you DQ how, how do you specify that? So if, how do you specify what to defer? You, you can write in the state defer E. But you want to qualify that based on what's in the queue. Is E an expression? Or? No, it's a static constant. Oh, so you are saying that can you, you can, uh, yeah, so the def defer thing is not an expression. It has to be a static constant. But in general, we have, you can store event IDs in variables. You can do that, except that today we don't allow uh, deferred annotation to be uh, non-constant. So this is, this is useful because uh, sometimes uh, uh, you don't want to start a new transaction. You, you're waiting for uh, an event that is going to complete whatever activity you had started earlier. So you temporarily block the starting of new activity. Um, and that simplifies your control logic. And that might be OK if the activity, um, uh, this other activity that you are, uh, uh, is, is the, the thing that you're waiting for, 
right? It, it, it's going to arrive soon. So, so sometimes you, you make that trade-off. And sometimes if you don't want to make that trade-off, you want to be really responsive, then you choose not to defer, but then you, ha you have to be prepared to handle both things. And then you get into this kind of explosion in your uh, state and so on. Yeah. So do you have fairness constraints which can be introduced as well? Uh, at not at the level of implementation, but uh, at the level of uh, liveness checking. We also have liveness monitor in the language. I can explain that later. Uh, so we do it, we check liveness properties under fair scheduling of all the machines. And uh, we also uh, have. Um, okay. So for modeling purposes, when we are writing uh, test harnesses or uh, models of what the environment of a particular component can do, then for modeling purposes, we provide this. Uh, non-deterministic choose operator. So, for example, you can say, hey, if star E, then you can send uh, event E1, else you can send event E2, right? So this creates a non-deterministic test harness. So in addition to this non-deterministic choice, we also have a fair non-deterministic choice. Actually, this is called dollar, and this is called double dollar. So this uh, non-deterministic choice means that you can create an infinite execution in which this always evaluates to true or always evaluates to false. If you use instead double dollar, then that means it's going to be fair. So you will not have uh, infinitely all the time uh, true or all the time false. Right? So sometimes you know these kinds of things might be useful. And uh, I mean, but this is relevant only when you are doing liveness checking. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Okay, so. Uh, for control flow inside a state, well, so what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm trying to give you an idea that when, when I use the word state, it's a little bit of a misnomer because these are macro states. It's not that a state is just one counter, right? There's control flow even inside a state. So, and so each macro state gets broken up into these little control locations. So when you enter a state, you write here, and then you execute the entry statement, which is a piece of code that you write in the state. And that does all the standard stuff, you know, computing on the variables, sending events, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's this event-driven loop. So you can install actions uh, inside, uh, based on an event. And if that event is dequeued from the, from the input queue, then you execute the action, which will be some code like this, and then you come back and wait again. But control doesn't leave the state. And at some point, maybe you dequeue an event for which there's an outgoing transition from the macro state. In, wh in which case, you execute the exit statement, and then you go to the next state, which will again look like this in the next state. OK? This is a visual representation of a, uh, a controller for uh, an elevator door. For an elevator, um, we have textual syntax, but we also have a tool uh, to visualize that textual syntax as this kind of a state transition diagram. And programmers seem to want this. And not surprising because, um, I mean, these are large go to programs, so you probably can get some insight by looking at the control flow of the, of the, of the events. Um, and what you saw in the picture was, was that that's right. what, what, what they used to use. That's right. So earlier in the very in version 0 of the language, uh, drawing a diagram like this in Visio was the primary means of creating a P program. And uh, the translation into both for testing purposes into Zing and into C code for execution used to happen from the metadata of that diagram. But since then, we have changed the story. Uh, we and create a P program just by textual editing. Because it's a very simple thing. We understand how to do it. All the textual diffing tools work well. Source Depot works well. Everything is based on text. We still want to provide the visualization service, but that's a pure visualization service. You, the current snapshot of the program is visualized into this kind of diagram, and you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so 
a few more things here. Uh, well, I can skip over all that. These are more details about uh, various sorts of uh, features of the of the language. If you're curious, I can I can I can talk with you separately about it. So let's go to specification and validation. The key, well, you know, this is one of the key reasons why somebody would want to write part of their application in P uh, rather than just writing in, in C code or C sharp code. Okay, so um, so what are the specification mechanisms? First of all, we have this default safety specification that if an event has been dequeued in a state, then it must be handled one way or another. Either there must be an installed action to handle it, or there must be uh, a transition that, that handles it. If not, then uh, an exception is thrown. And uh, that is considered a problem. OK? <coughs> uh, yeah. Is that a lightness property, or, I, or is that a safety property? So it's a safety property because. But it sounds like it will always be handled, so that sounds not like a. So there, because um, if we did not have that deferred uh, language feature, then we could never have a liveness problem in the language because of the semantics. But because we have deferred, it is not possible to uh, just block an event and not have even dequeue it. Because if an event is deferred, right, then it's not removed from the queue. If it's not removed from the queue, then that exception won't be thrown. So because of deferred, we have reintroduced the possibility of liveness failures. But the interesting thing is that by default, nothing is deferred. This is extremely important. So if you just forget to handle something, the testing will catch it. And then you either try to handle it, or if you choose to defer it and potentially introduce a liveness problem, then it's right there in the code. OK. In addition, um, we have uh, bounds on uh, queue sizes and on uh, maximum number of instances on a, on a per event basis also. So a lot of these uh, systems, I mean, the, the, the abstraction provided by the programming model is that of unbounded queues. But uh, that's not realistic, right? We cannot do unbounded resource consumption. So programmers typically um, try to budget for uh, how much memory is going to be consumed based on certain estimates of how fast work is going to flow flow into the system. Yeah, Rob? Sorry, can you define handle for me? Uh, so handle means that either there's an installed action on the event or there's an outgoing transition for it. It has a, I mean, basically to do that very precisely, I would have to tell you more details about the language features. But yes, it is very well defined. There's a formal operational semantics. Yeah. So it's some sort of an atomicity guarantee between the DQ event and the handling. So that both of them will ha happen or none of them will happen. Well, I mean, there's no shared memory here. So we don't have to worry about all this atomicity business. The semantics is that only, I mean, if you want to think in terms of threads, right, then you can imagine that there is one thread that is running per machine. It has access to the local state of that machine and to the queue. So the only shared memory in the system are the queues. So what we guarantee is that NQ and DQ are sort of thread safe operations. OK, we guarantee that. But once you have dequeued something, right, then there are no more races after that. Right? Yeah. How do you define, how do you know what events can be dequeued? What events can be dequeued? So it's based on the, uh, what is, the, what is the, uh, the deferred annotation in the state. So if the event, supposing the, in the state it says deferred E1, E2, then that means that uh, ignoring state hierarchy and call stacks and so on, it means that we start from the front of the queue and we look for the first event that is neither E1 or E2 and we dequeue it. 
Does it make sense? And you mentioned that every event has to be dequeued a bit, or not eventually. But is dequeued unless it's good for right? You will, if you find, if you walk through the queue, the first event that is not deferred, you will dequeue it. And if you dequeue it, then you have to handle it. Is it did I answer your question, couple? Yeah, maybe I can. So maybe I can. I can ask. Maybe. Okay. I can. All right. Okay. So bounds, providing bounds, either on a per queue basis or on a per event basis, is another way of injecting specifications into the into the code. Then you can write custom assertions on the state. Um, uh, I mean, you can use, we don't have preconditions and post conditions on these entry statements, exit statements, and so on, but you can write assertions to get the effect uh, of those things. And then we, uh, these assertions can be used to essentially write local specifications uh, of what, what's going on inside uh, a machine. But sometimes you may want to monitor events that happen across machines. So for that, we provide monitors. So monitors are these entities that are sitting sort of like at the top level. They are all the events that are happening in the system. They get funneled into the monitor. And the monitor can make transitions, just like another state machine, based on what it sees. And at some point, it can say, raise a red flag. Okay? And we have two kinds of monitors. We have safety monitors, and we have uh, liveness uh, monitors also. So you can, you can do liveness checking also. So here's some discussion about uh, environment modeling, which is a key. F yes. Mm -hmm. States have access to the monitors. States have what? Access to the monitors. All the one, um, say, I, I have to find the monitor saying that uh, the how many even events are there across the all the queues in the system. Can I have a, a, a condition deferred kind of thing into one of the states, one of the machines, machine states? I did not follow the question. Repeat, please. So what I'm saying is, if you define a monitor saying that, uh, uh, say, a count of uh, event type E1, that's my monitor, say, I, I'm maintaining across my states. Now, one of the machines wants to take a decision based on this count. No. So the monitor, the state of the monitor is not available. It's a pure specification construct. When we generate code for execution, monitors are erased. Okay. So, so doing some this kind of logic would be. If you want to have like a shared counter or something, you have to implement that as a machine. So, I mean, basically, this is the analogy between shared memory and message passing. What would happen is that if you want to implement a shared counter, the value of the counter is, is going to be stored inside uh, a local variable of a machine. And the increment operation would become a message. A decrement operation would become another message. Read operation would become yet another message. You would have to do stuff like that. Yeah, Rob. Out of curiosity, why is it that you don't translate the monitors to C code as well to make runtime monitors? Because I know a lot of other tools do that. Yes, yes. So um, there are. <laughs> This is actually a very long, this can potentially get into a long discussion. But the short answer is that consider the special kind of monitor which is monitoring only events that are coming from one machine. I think it is dead simple to do exactly what you are saying, which is compile that into code so you can monitor it. But supposing that um, uh, there's a monitor that's trying to monitor events across multiple machines. Then there are some that the semantics of the monitor calls is a little bit funky. It has this atomicity thing going on over there. So it would be a little bit hard to implement that. Um, I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not that straightforward. But in models, you can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you can do That's that. right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So environment modeling. So I showed you some code for the elevator controller, OK? Well, I mean, this controller, this code just doesn't just 
uh, run by itself. It's an open system. Um, it is receiving events from the environment and it is sending events to the environment. So it is not expected to work in a completely arbitrary environment that can supply any event at any point in time, right? And um, what does this environment look like? Well, I mean, it's probably going to run on some kind of an RTOS, right? And uh, uh, usually most of these things depend on uh, timeouts. So we will need an OS timer. So this is a service that is provided by the operating system. So we need some, some abstraction of, the, of an OS timer. Um, there's a door controller, the thing that is physically moving the door. There's going to be some software running for it. And that's interacting with this guy, again, via events. So we need a model for that door. Okay. And then finally, uh, there's the user who's pressing buttons in the elevator. Now this is actually, unlike this and this, this is a non-software component. This is modeling a, a human being. Well, in order to really test controller, we need uh, to uh, specify the behavior of this, this, and this. This is just as important as writing properties or assertions uh, of, of, of the controller. Well, in P, the nice thing is that the syntax that we use for uh, specifying code that gets compiled for execution is exactly the same that is get, that's gets used for specifying the OS timer, the user, and the door. All the syntactic features that are available for writing down uh, code for execution, they're also available for modeling. But what we do is we provide these little very simple things like the model keyword, uh, which you attach to the code describing the environment uh, so that the compiler knows that it needs to be stripped away when you're generating code for execution. But when we are generating code for systematic testing to, to Zing, that keyword doesn't make a difference. For that, it's always the same thing. And this is the point I was just making. Here's, here's for example, a model of a user. Uh, it just uh, um, makes a non-deterministic choice and sends either the open door event or the closed door event to the elevator controller. So this shows you an example of how star gets used. And of course, the type checker checks that uh, uh, star can only be used in model machines and in model functions. Uh, uh, it's not getting used in, 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 in real machines because we can't compile it. OK, so, <coughs> um, okay, so uh, we have, in, in addition to model machines, we also have model functions. And the programmer um, has to supply a model for it for validation and an implementation in C for execution. So when we uh, generate code for, for C, we, we uh, make a stub call. And the stub call has to be, the stub function has to be implemented separately. <sighs> okay, so a few words about uh, uh, validation. So I, I was earlier saying that uh, you know this these uh, P programs that Turing complete so validation of P is undecided. Yeah. So, uh, about this problem of the model and the implementation time So uh, these two can still diverge. Correct. Yes, it can. They can diverge. Yeah. And that's an issue. Um, we we don't have an answer to to this thing right now. Um, one thing is that uh, it can diverge, but I feel like it's a little bit easier problem to deal with because a lot of the protocol has already been lifted out. So this divergence is kind of like the divergence between a sequential uh, C code and its sequential spec, which is still a problem, but maybe not as severe as uh, protocol issues. Uh, it, it may be possible to to cross-validate the implementation with respect to the model by injecting uh, runtime assertions. But I don't know yet how to do that. OK. <clears throat> so we can't, I mean, in the worst case, we can't verify P programs. Um, uh, I mean, lots of, but the thing is that, you know, that what I'm saying here is just an excuse. I mean, there's a lot of undecidable problems, right? We can't verify C programs also, but there's still you know, a lot of type checking that flushes out lots of errors. Um, and we do a little bit of that, but uh, 
I guess I don't really know what a good tag system would be that can catch all these concurrency and asynchrony errors. So we just do the next best thing, which is we do systematic testing of the non-deterministic operational semantics. Um, and there are two sources of non-determinism, the explicit choice uh, that I was showing you there, and the implicit scheduling choice between the concurrently executing machines. And we systematically enumerate both those choices. So this creates a very large search space. Um, and I mean, you have to do a lot of work. Uh, but the nice thing is that we get to uh, reuse a lot of the infrastructure that was developed earlier in the Zing project. And we just have this compiler that compiles down to uh, Zing. So there's a trade-off here. I mean, the problem, we, we get to reuse Zing, but we have to write two compilers. And we have to maintain both those codes. Um, uh, it would be nice if, uh, you know, somehow I can do Zing-style systematic testing on the generated C code itself. Uh, but that's not how it is architected today. So searching efficiently, we have implemented some tricks. Uh, there are simple things like exploiting commutativity. So I mentioned that after an event is dequeued, uh, there could be a lot of computation on the variables local to a machine and then sends to other machines. Well, we, uh, in the, in the, theoretically in the operational semantics, there's a scheduling point after each instruction, but we don't inject scheduling points after uh, local computation. So only at uh, receives, at dequeues, and at sends do we inject uh, scheduling points. And in fact, um, uh, we can, based on the operational semantics of Zing, we can even argue that the dequeue commutes forward in time. So we don't even have to uh, introduce a scheduling point after a dequeue. Then uh, another, uh, Shriram, how am I doing on time right now? Um, 15 minutes. 15 minutes still? Okay, all right. Um, then um, um, it is well known that if you are doing systematic search, then um, both depth first search and breadth first search have, have problems. So, depth first search, the nice thing about depth first search is very space efficient, okay? Um, because the, the stack, uh, which is you know, the pending work, pending search that you have to do, you can maintain it very compactly uh, using this uh, state delta representation. So as you make a transition from uh, on the stack, you can just uh, store what changed, okay? Um, if you, uh, uh, on the other hand, you know, breadth first search is not very uh, state, state efficient. Uh, on the other hand, depth first search has this problem that um, uh, for large state spaces, your search can go and get stuck in one part uh, of the of the state space and then you know by the time you backtrack maybe you know years have elapsed and then you never go over there. Um, breadth first search gives you good c coverage, right? So, um, so uh, we try to uh, work around these kinds of problems by implementing essentially iterative deepening. So iterative deepening, the vanilla iterative deepening that comes from uh, classic AI literature is iterative deepening with execution depth. So you do depth first search with a certain bound on the execution depth, and when that finishes, then you increment it, and then when that finishes, then you increment it, and so on and so forth. So this way, uh, uh, we get the space efficiency of DFS, uh, but we get incremental coverage. Uh, but the price we, of course, pay is that of redundancy. So when we go from, say, k to k plus 1, all the work that was done in k gets repeated. Um, or, or, or we have to either we do that or we pay the space cost of maintaining the frontier, which is going again a little bit towards, uh, uh, you know, the breadth for search. Okay, so there's all those kinds of trade-offs. So another thing that we have done is uh, uh, iterative deepening with respect to depth is good for finding shallow bugs. Okay, bugs that are hit with uh, a small depth, but deeper bugs. Uh, it's uh, very hard to hit them. I mean, the bug could be conceptually very shallow. You just follow some default scheduling strategy and then boom, there's an assertion failure right there. But if that happens very deep in the execution, just not going to hit it. So what we have also done here is provided a general framework for doing iterative deepening with respect to delaying schedulers. So in the next couple of slides, I want to uh, uh, explain a little bit about what, what, that, what that is. 
So this is the standard view of state transition graphs on which all these search algorithms are defined. So this is the initial state, and then you have a bunch of uh, transitions coming out of it, and then you know they lead to states, and they have a bunch of transitions coming out, and so on and so forth. Then you can do DFS, DFS, whatever the hell on this. So in the in, in classic search algorithms, there is no ordering between these transitions. Doesn't matter what order you explore those transitions in. Okay. So here's an alternative view of state transition graphs. Let's try to, to give weights to outgoing transitions such that the lowest weight is always zero and weights get incremented by one. Okay, so we have zero, one, two up to n minus 1, where n is the number of outgoing transitions. And let's uh, have a, a strategy, a prioritization strategy, where we prioritize not the depth of the execution, but we prioritize the cost of the execution. So we, we say that, hey, I want to first generate all schedules with cost 0. Then I want to say all schedules with cost 1. Then all schedules with cost 2, and so on. right? Now, this is very interesting because imagine that when we, we say that we want to generate all schedules with cost, cost zero. Well, the schedule that goes along the left branch will, will be that schedule. And notice that you can go arbitrarily deep. It doesn't get stopped anywhere. Okay? So this is the interesting thing about doing uh, uh, prioritization in this way. You don't artificially block the uh, execution from making progress. Okay, so now the question is, how do we uh, define this zero, one, two? How do we know which one is zero, which one is one, which one is two? So for that, our answer is we we have a, a, a determin we use a deterministic scheduler. So imagine that you take the concurrent program and you attach a deterministic scheduler to it. So it, the deterministic scheduler completely eliminates the scheduling non-determinism. So it's going to take a particular path through the transition graph. And we'll call that path the zero path. So the deterministic scheduler is what the zero transition is going to be. OK? And then what we can do is we can equip that deterministic scheduler with a delay operation. It says, hey, change your default uh, scheduling strategy. So every time you call that, it changes it a little bit. So now by mixing up calls to give me the next uh, task to schedule and calls to delay, we can now systematically generate all possible schedules. And we can come up with the numbering 0, 1, 2 by saying how many delay operations are needed to generate this particular transition. OK, so we have implemented um, a whole bunch of uh, uh, delaying schedulers. And uh, we have evaluated them uh, on lots of examples from different sources. Turns out that, of course, you know, the ability to find bugs quickly depends on which particular deterministic scheduler you are using to seed the search, not surprisingly. So this is, well, I mean, what would be very nice if there was one scheduler that uniformly works across the board, but that is very unlikely. Um, but still, it's not that bad, because what this means is that we, we provide the tester or the programmer with a way to build custom search. Right? So if the programmer wants to search in this part of the state space, he just has to write a scheduler. We have a generic scheduling framework. He just plugs that in, and then the search gets orchestrated in that way. So we, we actually, in this way, we have provided a, a, a testing platform. Uh, that programmers can use to, uh, to, to, to do search in a custom way. If, for example, they feel that the, the schedulers that we provide is not giving them good coverage. Oh, and by the way, you know, all the stuff that I'm talking about works both for safety and liveness. And it can be parallelized on a multi-core. So you get a lot of stuff. OK, so now I'm going to conclude. The, the, we're moving to the final part of the talk. I'm going to tell you a little bit about compiler and runtime. OK, so compiler is actually very simple. So it converts the program into a collection of index tables. These are essentially C data structures that are arrays, giant arrays that are pointing to each other. So this is all the metadata of the, of the program, 
all the, the events and then the machines and the states inside them and transitions and actions and functions and so on. So that's one part of the code gen and the second part is all the entry statements, action bodies, they get compiled into C functions. Okay. And then we have written this runtime which captures essentially the operational semantics of the P language that uh, accesses all this metadata and basically executes the operational semantics of the, of the program. So this is run, written once and for all by us, the P developers. Uh, this is generated by an automate, automated code generation tool on a per program basis. The two together are linked together with the foreign code to create the application. Okay, we can skip all this. Okay, so this is what uh, application development looks like. This is in the context of uh, driver development in, without P. So the, we write the entire driver uh, in C, okay, and that's uh, interacting with the OS and hardware. Now, with, when you have P, there's a P runtime written once and for all. You don't have to write it again and again. There is the P code, and then there is the foreign code or the C code. The P code is going to be compiled to generated C code. Then these three things link together, are compiled and linked together to create the driver executable. Um, so now we are trying to also um, um, uh, use P to uh, implement fault-tolerant distributed services uh, because protocols are really important in those applications also. And as far as I can tell, that the, the debug test challenges uh, for those protocols are on par, perhaps even worse than what we're facing in the low-level OS world. So I think we can provide some, some value there. Um, yeah, so we have made some progress. and. Uh, um, we can, I can tell you more about it uh, offline. So that concludes my, my talk. Time for like a couple of questions. Can you see how easier it difficult it was for them to write the USB protocol in P? Like, did, did they miss having shared memory? Did they miss other aspects? How many changes? So I think that this, this business about missing shared memory in my mind, that's probably the biggest blocker because you have to really, it sort of like straight jackets you. But once you cross that, I think that the separation between the protocol code and the non-protocol code is very clear in the programmer's head already. And writing it in P syntax versus C syntax, it imposes a little bit of overhead because now you have to, all the interfaces for the foreign function and so on have to become ex explicit. Um, so that's the negative side, but and you know, so the positive side is all the testing that you get. Um, so I would say that from a conceptual standpoint, it's not hard once you have crossed the shared memory barrier, but it's kind of annoying that you have to do all this modeling. So technically, there is, I mean, there is shared memory in some weird sense, right? Because on, even on a single machine, if you receive an event, uh, you might want to. Uh, send events out to other machines, yeah. but you still have your calls back with you, and in the meanwhile, you might want to process other events. Yeah. Right? So, so there is parallelism in the sense that all the machines are running at the same time. So I didn't talk about it. Well, let me just go back to that slide. In the runtime, okay. So imagine that there's like three machines that are running, okay. So if the environment outside these three machines, you, it could happen that one entity enqueues an event in this machine at the same time as another entity enqueues an event in this machine. Well, they're going to, they're going to start running concurrently and, and, and doing their processing. So there's parallelism there. And Even within a machine, I mean, as part of a larger workflow, yeah. I might have an event that I receive and I have some state on which it operates on. Then as part of processing that event, I send events out to other machines. Yes. I'm waiting for yes. a response. Yes. But in the meanwhile, I can get other events. Yes. Which all operate on the same state, on, even on that machine. Yes. So, so that that is, that, that is you. Kind of RAM, if you want to. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. With a very weird memory model. Yeah. That's right. Yes. That's right. That. Yeah. So I agree with you. I think that it doesn't. You would shared state. The problem of shared state doesn't go away. Yeah. 
And that's actually kind of obvious because if the problem of shared state went away, then all the problems related to concurrency and asynchrony and all those race condition, that would go away. So that is the real problem. That is the problem. What we don't have is all those low level shared memory issues. I mean, the way you don't have locks, for example, here. You don't, have, you don't have to worry about weak memory model issues, right? You don't have to worry about all this compiler reordering and all that stuff. But you have to worry about event reordering. Yes, you have to worry about event reordering. You have to worry about, you know, this guy is doing a send, this guy is doing a send, both are going to the same machine. Okay, well, maybe this send got dequeued there first before this, or maybe in another situation, this send got enqueued there before this one, and so on and so forth. You have to worry about those kinds of things. So you still have to, yeah. Uh, but just a question about time. I, I wonder, I mean, do aspects of the USB specification depend on timing? Like, do you have to do this within so many milliseconds or you drop it? And do you allow the inside a, inside a machine to, to call the timing function and the timer? Yeah, time, yeah. so the, the timer uh, is modeled as a separate machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, the, the, in reality, the, um, the OS uh, timer, uh, timer mechanism is, is invoked, but uh, because there are race conditions there, we model that as a machine and then we get to explore all that. And you also check timing properties or that's outside the scope of No, so the operational semantics is completely untimed. What that means is that from the point of view of the tests that are generated at the Zing level, a timer with a timeout of one millisecond uh, can expire later than a timer with a timeout of one million seconds. And you have any sense of, of properties that you check? You know, what's the overlap or partial overlap between the, the actual bug reports and the USB stack? I mean, I, this isn't a complete guarantee that it is no. implemented correctly. So timing is one thing which is outside the scope. Are there other properties that are outside scope? And, uh, um, I mean, how does the, what was the reaction from the bus? So I think that, for example, uh, uh, I think it's kind of related to timing, but performance is outside the scope. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, so for example, memory safety issues that are happening in the foreign code, they are outside. For the computation that's happening in P, we provide basically safe, you know, the exception semantics, right? We fail safe kind of deal but you know once you are in foreign code which is implemented in C anything can happen is there a performance overhead to writing um, I, I think that there might be a little bit but it was not a big deal at all in fact I remember an anecdote where they were able to write more fine grained event processing I see where I think I remember Vivek what, what he was doing was that without P he was actually had to do more Post grain transactions, mm -hmm. where when he, once he received an event, he had to do a lot of processing. Now he could actually break it up into more fine grained things, and he wouldn't have been able to do it if he didn't have the assurance of the model checker. Oh, because it. the thing is that if he was doing it using like actually fine grained locking, then there would be more chances of bugs so and so on. Wrong. So oh, he I was see. able to do more fine grained, uh, fine grained code. That's not because of using P. Not because of P is more expressive or anything. No, it's not. It's just that he could, he could get the testing for free, which gave him more confidence. I see. Otherwise, he, he, he would, you know, right, right. his experience is that he would get more bugs. Okay. What, what we try to provide is we, we try to get your code to a certain level of crappiness as quickly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you know how many uh, specs were written? How many assertions were written which were not the default ones that P comes with? Um, so, I think that. Uh, there were a lot of them, especially in the first one, because in the first one, they went, they took a really extreme thing. They wanted, they were so concerned about coverage that um, they would try to check each machine separately. And so they had to write a lot of, do, had to do a lot of environment modeling to constrain the environment of that machine. So all that stuff is really extra stuff, you know, like model code. Um, so I think that there was a lot more modeling done in the first one. In the phone drivers, uh, there was less. Um, you know, I think that the I think that it was significantly less. I think that for the phone drivers, they were mostly relying on uh, mostly relying on uh, unhandled events the default specs.
They they did use uh, event bounds though, and and queue bounds. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Charles again. But for example, like the prototypes that, uh, so for this summer, Ankush was an intern with me. So he built, uh, he was trying to build the entire service for, say, a distributed key value store. So he wrote a lot of models and he used a lot of monitors uh, for, for doing the verification. So he, in that, in, in that case, uh, he wrote a lot of uh, stuff that was outside the default specifications.